In the book of Numbers, we turned last evening, we've been having four stages, three stages of the journey to take this week of the pilgrimage of the children of Israel, typing, as we believe in typology, typing the old church with the new, them in the natural, we in the spiritual. The Lord has met with us. We got back in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, on down into the bondage in Egypt. Then last evening, the Lord blessed us, and we brought them out up to the Red Sea, over to the smitten rock. There, standing before God. Now tonight, we take them into Kadesh Barnea, up to the judgment seat before the brazen altar, or the brazen serpent, rather. Tomorrow night, the Lord willing, we take them over into the homeland. Oh, my. Come out. We're going to cross Jordan tomorrow, the Lord willing. Joshua told him to gather yourselves together now. We're going to cross over. Not just before. You know, there's none of us but any minister but what has got God on his heart. But when he looks at the Scriptures, he, he just has a little fear. Am I going at it in my own self, or is the Holy Spirit here to lead me? Amen. Remember that the seed that's sown, it'll no doubt take hold somewhere. And we want it to be the real, true, unadulterated seed of God that's sown into the people's heart. For Sunday, I must stand in the judgment to give an account for what I've said and done in this life along with you. If I'd be a misleading, then I would be counted uh, a misleader, and I certainly wouldn't want to do that, not willfully. Just before we have prayer, or before we have prayer over the Word, you know the Bible said that when John saw it in the book of Revelations, he said he saw uh, the book, and it was sealed on the back, front and back side, and no man in heaven, and no man in earth, or no man under the earth was worthy to take the book or to even look on it. And then a lamb that had been slain from the foundation of the world came and taken it out of the hand of the one that sat on the throne. And their elders cried out, Thou art worthy. Now may that lamb tonight come and open up the word. We can lay back the pages, but it takes the Lamb of God to open up the word. Shall we bow our heads? Brother Junior, lead us in a word of prayer, if you will, while pray that God will open his word to us, if you will. All right. Lord bless you now. Turn to begin with tonight to Numbers, the 13th chapter. We begin there, and then we follow on just... I'll try not to do as I have been doing, just keeping you a long time, but uh, now let you go just as soon as possible, as soon as the Holy Spirit will say it's enough, then we'll go. Tomorrow morning, now remember, Sunday school, 9.30. And by 4 or by 10 o'clock, we'll be answering the questions. Bring in your questions. Bring them in tonight. After the service, give them to some of the elders so I can get them or some way for the questions tomorrow. Got a nice number of them. Tomorrow night is the crossing the Jordan. Now, we've had three stages. There's three stages of the journey. Israel in Egypt. Israel in the wilderness. Israel in the homeland. Palestine, promised by God hundreds of years before. All right. We find then, taking the church back just for a little preview, found out that God promised Abraham that he would save him, give him an unconditional promise, unconditional covenant. He would save him and his seed. Not all of his seed, but his promised seed, Isaac. Abraham had 11 sons, you know, but only one of them was a promise through Isaac. That's the reason Paul said in, in Romans uh, 9th chapter that all that are Israel are not Israel, but through Isaac shall the seed be called. Now, then God through Isaac representing Christ, we notice Christ was in Abraham, Christ was in Isaac, Christ was in Jacob, Christ was in Joseph, Christ was in Moses. Christ is in all the Old Testament. 
and all the Old Testament, all the... If we had time here seven years ago this last week, this last few months, we've taken the book of Exodus from one side to the other, typing everything, even the waters of separation. The red heifer, it couldn't be a brown one, it had to be a red one, not a spot on it. It had to be burned and then uh, made into the waters of separation. And it's a sprinkle of people. After they had sinned and had gone outside the camp, how the hossip and cedar uh, wood and all mixed in together, how the wood in the tabernacle, how the brazen altar, the laver, the showbread, everything pointed to Christ. And in Him we are complete, in Jesus Christ. Now, how wonderful our lesson is tonight. How God brought Israel as a type, foreshadowing what would be. Now, we find out then the after 400 years, God had promised Abraham that his seed would sojourn in a strange land for 400 years, but would come out under the mighty hand. God's promises always come true. God always makes his word right. The old prophetic wheels and cogs of God grind slowly but surely. comes right up to the place. That's the reason tonight, studying this exodus of the church, I believe that we're in the exodus again. I believe Moses being a perfect type of the church organization which failed God, and Joshua the new, new leader represents the church in their failings of God, and Joshua took Israel across to the Promised Land. Perfect, if we'll watch it, how that God moved back there in the days everything went fine, they thought they were settled down for good, but when the time of the promise drew nigh, there rose up a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. Things began to move different. And it was a time for a deliverance. The people began to groan and cry. And then God came down to deliver them. How perfect. And then he sent a man, a child was born, a peculiar child. And he was raised a peculiar life. But God had his hand up on him. Moses, how he was hid in the bulrush. Born in a time of persecution, just like Christ. Born to proper child, just like Christ. And he was... Uh, uh, born to, in this world to be a deliverer, just like Christ. And all how he, his work, how he's a lawgiver, went up in the mountains and stayed 40 days, come back out with the law. And he, his besetting sin was temper. He broke the commandments, went back up, showing that that priesthood must die, pass away, just as Jesus went into the wilderness 40 days. And when he came out, Jesus... Satan met him just in his weak spot like he did Moses. Jesus' weak spot was hunger. He said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be turned to bread. Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. He knew he hadn't met Moses then. He knew he had met something besides Moses. For Jesus knew the Word. And if there's anything that the church ought to know today is God's Word. How to set it together and apply it to your heart. For this is a day, brethren, you'll bear me record, a day of ism. I've been studying Genesis now for two years of Genesis. That's the beginning. They're going forth the seed chapter. And you'll notice that all those cults of this day are beginning in Genesis. They had their start back in Genesis winding up out here in the last day. For instance, many of them like uh, how the formal religion began and Cain, how it come on out and come down through the sons of Noah, Ham, out of Ham he had Nimrod. Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. Babel comes on down through Nebuchadnezzar's time and on out into Revelation, Babylon. How that little seed started way back there at the east side of the gates of Eden, coming on down, winding out. 
All kinds of cults and everything started back there winding themselves out to the end. Now, it behooves us to watch, be careful, be set in the Word. Many things are taking place today which are unscriptural. Let's watch the Scripture. Be sure that where we're right. That's what we've been trying to teach this week. The greatest thing that I find against the church tonight is fear. Everybody's scared to death about something. What are you scared about? If a man's born again, he should be happy, carefree, just like these fellows singing up here and a brother testifying back there. Just free. There ain't nothing can harm you. Nothing present, nothing future, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. God has promised. He's called by election. He set his church in order. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draws him. You never come to God because that you wanted to. You come because Christ called you. God called you. And he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. I'll give him everlasting life. Not just lasting for a week, one revival to another, but everlasting, eternal life. And we'll raise him up at the last day. Oh, my. If that doesn't take the wind out of Satan's sails, I don't know what does. Say, how do you know? I said, Jesus said so. Thus saith the Lord. Jesus said so. That settles it. If he said it, I believe it. He said in John 5, 24, pet subject to me, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but pass from death unto life. That's pretty easy, Brother Branham. No man, no man can believe Jesus to be the Christ in his heart and will be the same man that he was before. Can't do it. No, sir. As I said last night, Drinking, smoking, gambling, all those things isn't sin. It isn't sin to gamble. It isn't, uh, gambling isn't sin, rather. Smoking isn't sin. Drinking isn't sin. Swearing isn't sin. It's an attribute of sin. Because you're a sinner, that's the reason you do it. If you was a Christian, you wouldn't do it. He said, he that loves the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not in the, even in him. So now you're either, uh, you never did see a halfway Christian. I asked someone the other night, I said, are you a Christian, brother? He said, I'm a pretty good Christian. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> there is no pretty good Christian. How many have ever seen a drunk, sober man? Nobody. How many have ever seen a black, white bird? Nobody. It's either you've never seen a sinner saint. You're either born again or you're not born again. You're either on one side of the fence. And now, if you are born again, you have everlasting life. And there's nothing within you. All the old things has passed away, and it's just a, the fountain. Bitter and sweet water don't come from the same fountain. See? The tree's known by the fruit it bears. By the fruit you shall know them. Long time ago, all the Methodist people thought, boy, we got it. We can shout. After Luther's age, they thought because they were shouting, they had it. I believe in shouting, too. But that's no reason I got it. <laughs> that's the attribute that I got it. Amen. The Pentecost come along, spoke in tongues. They said, oh, now we know we got it. Did you? About <laughs> change your mind now. That ain't it. Find out it isn't it. Brother, dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. To all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. See, here's what it is. Ever since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supplied, Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Though I speak with tongue of men and angels, and I have not love, it profit me nothing. Though I have give all my goods to feed the poor, it profit me nothing. Though I have power to move mountains and so forth, it profit me nothing. Where there's prophecies, it'll fail, and where there's tongues, it'll cease, and where there's knowledge, it'll vanish away. But when perfect love has come into the human heart, all demons in hell will never be able to upset it. Amen. That's right. Amen. If my wife was, was respect me because she was afraid of me, I wouldn't be, I'd be afraid to leave her. But she loves me. 
she's got confidence in me because she knows I love her and she loves me. Now when I go away, I don't have to say, now, Miss Branham, I'm going to leave you a rule of orders here that you should do a group of orders. You shall not look at any other man. You shall not do this or you should. I, why, she just says automatically. I love her and she loves me and that just settles it. I just go on. That's the way it is living for Christ. Hallelujah. You just love him with all your heart, soul, and mind and go on. That's all. There's no evil can come out. That's right, because in your all thing, you're dead. You are dead, and your life is hidden. God through Christ sealed in there by the Holy Ghost. Amen. How's the devil going to get you? No. Hey. You take a box car. They'll start loading it and loading it on the track. Many of you people here, I know some of you, that loads cars. And they'll go around, they'll call for so much here and so much there. But before that car can be sealed, the inspector has to come along. He looks through and he sees that everything's in there is tight. Everything's ready. It's going to its destination. Well, if there's anything loose and afraid it'll break, you will say, take her out, fix her over again until you get it. And when it's all together tightened and packed and set down, then you'll slam the doors and seal it. And no one can break that seal until it goes to its destination. Is that right? Amen. That's the way it is where it says Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of your redemption. Amen. Got some loose rattles? God will take it out of you and, and fix it up before you're sealed into the kingdom. Every man in here, every woman, without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the only reason you haven't got it because you believe not. Amen. That's right. I uh, believe we took it this week and proved it, that Abraham believed God by faith. That's right. Now, that's good Baptist doctrine, to believe God. Brother Tom, you know, I think you come out of a Baptist church. That They said, believe God, so did I. <laughs> it's a good church to be out of. <laughs> oh, oh, excuse me. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> now, just a moment. I ain't got nothing against the Baptists. They got a whole lot of good things. But look, brother, I heard him on the radio the other day, a fellow, a fine Baptist minister, trying to bypass Acts 19. He said, Apollos didn't know Jesus, so that's the reason they had to be rebaptized again. Oh, no, Apollos didn't know Jesus, and he was proven by the Word of God that Jesus was the Christ. Amen. Amen. And he said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Amen. That's right. Amen. God gave Abraham the promise, and he believed the promise, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness, but he gave him the sign of circumcision as a seal of the promise. Amen. Hallelujah. You believe God by faith that you are saved and accept him, and whenever you do, God gives you the Holy Ghost as a seal of the promise that he promises. The Holy Ghost is a gift of God. Amen. That's right. That circumcises the heart, cuts Amen. away the surplus flesh, and makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. There you are. It's nothing you have to do with yourself. It's a gift of God. Amen. And when you believe correctly, God gives it to you. It's Amen. by faith. You Now, faith isn't what it is. It's like I have a quarter and a loaf of bread costs a quarter. The quarter... I'll pick it up after a while. The quarter is not the loaf of bread... But the quarter purchases the loaf of bread. It's a price. It's a. It's what purchases the loaf of bread. It happened to be that it happened to be a half a penny from Africa. So I guess that's the reason it flipped. <laughs> All right. The quarter is not the loaf of bread. The quarter purchases the loaf of bread. Faith is what you have in God, and that in recognition of God for your faith gives you the Holy Ghost that circumcises the heart and ears. Is that right? Amen. Makes you a new creature. Amen. Now, God getting ready to deliver, we found out that he was, Moses was taking his own son down for, to deliver the children of Israel uncircumcised. And Zipporah took a sharp stone, cut the foreskin off her child, and threw it before him, said, Thou art a bloody husband to me. You know, you ever study that right close? Moses had a temper, you know, that finally kept him out of the promised land. His temper. And he, God sent him back out there and gave him a little high-tempered wife, too. <laughs> I bet they had some trouble on the backside of that desert, don't you? God knows how to tame you down. So he fixed him back out there as a little woman. Showed she cut that foreskin off and told her before him, said, you're a bloody husband. Ma, you know how to fix him up. <laughs> Take that temper out of him. All right. 
Then they went on down and he done signs and wonders and miracles. And notice, oh my, I felt something strike me. Look, how the Jambres and Jambres and two astrologers stood there and performed the same kind of miracles that Moses and Aaron did. Went right along with them. Impersonation. Brother, we got the world full of it today. Amen. The church is full of it today. Amen. Carl comparison. And there's one thing. Now to cut this off, notice, as a great Bible teacher that on the radio said, that divine healing was of the devil, that the devil did divine healing. I want you to find me the scripture where the devil ever done divine healing, where it's ever promised by him. God said, I'm the Lord, Psalms 103, 3, I'm the Lord who healeth all of thy diseases. And Jesus said, if Satan cast out Satan, then his kingdom's divided. Again, he can't do it. He can't cast himself out. So all healing, no matter where it comes from, comes by God alone. And watch these magicians. They could bring the lies, but they couldn't take them away. They couldn't heal. They could perform the miracle, but they couldn't perform healing. Healing lays in God alone. And when they called for balls, the Egyptians broke out in balls themselves. They said, this is the finger of God. Hallelujah. I think of that finger of God. If God could open a blinded eyes by his finger, this is the finger of God. Could do all these things. Look what he did with his finger. He healed the sick and raised the dead. All these things he done with his finger. But when he went after a lost sheep, he never used his finger. He put him on his shoulder and brought him in. Hallelujah. What a security. A lost sheep on his shoulder. Not his finger he didn't use. He used his shoulder to pack the sheep in. Notice, then God, after fixing Moses, getting him ready, sent out the... Uh, the signs, then the last sign we taken last night was death. And we found out that spiritual death in the church, the last plague now. Church drying up, blown away. That's right. We're living in a horrible time. How oh, that the church, that, the old timers that used to really have the victories, losing out. Dying time. Letting the blood get off the front of the door. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. On up they come into the smitten rock. Notice when they come to the rock. They had need. Now Moses smote the rock with the rod. That's where we left last night. Smote the rock with the rod. And the rod was God's judgment rod. And he smote the rock, and there was a cleft in the left side of the rock. When the children of Israel got hungry... They went there in a beehive. A bee had got in there and it made a hive and they got honey out of the rock. Everything they had need of was in the rock. The rock followed the church and the rock was Christ Jesus. When they were thirsty, they drank from the rock. When they were hungry, they ate from the rock. Wherever they went, the rock followed them. And the rock still followed the church. Christ is the rock that was in the wilderness. Notice now. Then, that same rock, no wonder, when he came into Jerusalem. They said, make him hold his peace. Make them hold their peace. He said, if they hold their peace, the rocks, stones, will immediately cry out. What was it? That chief cornerstone was come rolling down among the stones. Something had to take place. Rocks crying out when the woman that had a blood issue for so many years, she spake to the rock, and the rock brought forth healing. When Lazarus was dead, Martha spoke to the rock, and it brought forth resurrection. When they were up on the sea, storms about, and the little old boat were tossed around like a bottle stopper out in the middle of the sea. A woman said to me here not long ago, she said, Brother Branham, she said, Jesus wasn't no more than an ordinary man. Said he was a prophet, but you try to make him God. I said, he was God. He's either God or a deceiver. And he said, oh, he was a good man. He was a philosopher, but he couldn't be God. 
He wasn't divine. I said he was divine. He had to be divine. If he was a man, he was born special birth. But he was born a virgin birth, so he was God's blood. The Bible said we're saved by the blood of God. She said, I'll prove it to you. He was no more than God, no more than a, a, a prophet. And he wasn't divine. I said, if you can prove it by the Bible, she said, I'll do it. I said, let's hear your scripture. She said in St. John, the 11th chapter, when Jesus went down that day to the grave of Lazarus, I said, I remembered, said, he cried. The Bible said, he wept. I said, that's true. I said, what's that got to do with it? She said, that proves he wasn't divine because he could not weep and be divine. I said, look, woman, he was the God-man. I said, when he went down there crying, while he was crying, he was a man. But I'll tell you, when he pulled that little frame up there and said, I am the resurrection and life, and he spoke to a man that he's been dead four days, his body was rotten, the skin worms was crawling in and out, corruption knew its master, and a man that had been dead four days stood on his feet and lived again. That was more than a man speaking. That was God. Yes, sir. He was a man when he was up on a mountain that night, come down looking all around over a tree to find something to eat, a fig tree. Trying to, he was hungry. He was hungry when he was a man. When he was looking on that tree, he was a man. But when he took five biscuits and two pieces of fishes and fed 5,000, that was more than God, more than a man. That was God in that man. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Truly, he was a man when he was laying in that boat and the stoppers, like a bottle stopper, said a while ago, push him around and bounce him up and down. 10,000 devils of the sea swore they'd drown him. That night, he was a man so tired that he couldn't move. But when he put his foot on the rail of that boat and said, Peace be still, and the winds and the waves obeyed him, that was more than a man. That was God. Yes, sir. When he died at Calvary, he screamed for mercy like a man. He was a man when he died, but when he rose Easter morning, he proved that he was God. That's right. Rose up from the dead. No one of the poets said, Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming. Oh, glorious day. The God-man. God was in his Son, reconciling the world to himself. They claimed it to be a, mag a magician and a, a soothsayer and a devil and Beelzebub and everything, but he was God Emmanuel dwelling among us, reconciling the world to himself. We got that on a question in the morning anyhow. We'll get on that and finish that tomorrow. All right. Coming on up, that smitten rock. When they had need of anything, they went to the rock. Now, after all of that, the blessings and things, they still murmured. They come to the place called Kadesh Barnea. Now we want to study this just a moment. Kadesh Barnea was the judgment seat of the world in the day. That's found 13th chapter now of uh, Numbers. You go to Mark in the Scriptures if you wish now. And there was the judgment seat. Read the previous chapters to it in, in your study. We just have to hit the high places now in three or four days revival like this. They study it verse by verse. But it was a judgment seat. There was a great well there. Had many little wells out from it. That tributaries are, are springs from this great huge spring. Kadesh Barnea. Perfect type of the church. The church is the judgment seat. Judgment begins in the house of God. There Israel gathered around in Kadesh. And now Moses said here, First verse, thirteenth chapter, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou man that they may search the land of Canaan, which I have given unto the children of Israel, of every tribe, of their fathers, shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. Now, God ordained that they should send twelve men over one out of each tribe sending them over into the land of Canaan to spy out the land, to see whether it was a good place or not. The spies went forth, one out of every tribe, one out of Dan, Asher, uh, all through, until they got the twelve men, perfect of the church today. In our journeys, we are journeying up to, I believe, that the church is standing today at Kadesh Barnea. Judgment! 
Now, God help me. I hope God will help me to get this that will sink in good and deep. Sending out exploits. Remember, they had come this far because God had promised them. And all along the line, they had signs and wonders and miracles, and now they're right up to the borderland. I believe we're on the borderland tonight. I was wondering about all my meetings and things, how I had to cast them out. I truly believe before the church can have uh, the rapture, it's got to have rapture and faith. We can't even have faith for divine healing, let alone rapture and faith. Got to have a faith that will change and quicken this body and be taken away. I believe there's a church on its road tonight. A power of the living God, that man will speak the word here and there and it'll flash like lightning. And a church is coming out, not a psychologist, not some of this put on make believe, but a real, true, genuine, anointed, Holy Ghost called out church. Amen. 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 Here they are, standing at Kadesh, Barnea. They said, Go over. The land was given to us hundreds of years ago by God to our Father. We are the seed of Abraham. God has led us safely just 40 some odd miles from Egypt up to the borderland of Kadesh. They got up there in a few days. But remember, because of their unbelief, made them wonder for 40 years. Unbelief. Notice the church I'm speaking of. Parabolic speaking, what the old was, the new is, in a more magnified way. What the natural was, the spiritual is. Now, Kadesh, and there he said, now you go out and spy out. God sent them. Moses never, God sent them over. And said, go over and spy out the land and come back and tell us whether it's a good land or a bad land or whether we can take it or what this, that, or the other. You go over and find out. And 12 went over. They cut a great cluster of grapes. You know about the harlot Rahab and so forth. All right. They went over and cut this cluster of grapes and returned back. But listen at the report. Twelve. Man, and ten out of the twelve said, Oh, they are fearful people. Look over here. What a, what a sight. Listen to this. When we turn over now to the 17th verse or the 27th verse, rather, to read, goes ahead and tells there the man that was sent out. And when they returned back, their hearts were fainting. They said, Oh, they're a great man. Listen here. And they told them and said, We come into the land wherewith thou sent us, and surely it flows of milk and honey, and it is a fruit, the fruit of it, just as God promised. Now notice, nevertheless, the people are strong and dwell in the, uh, dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw children of Amalek there, and the Amalites dwell in the land, and the Hadonites, the Juvenites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell at the sea, or the coast of Jordan. And Caleb, hallelujah, Caleb still the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Ah, oh, I like that. My. Just a little farther. But the man that went up with him said, We be not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched out for the children of Israel, saying, The land which we have gone to search, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are man great statues. Listen to that. 
And he goes on to say that we look like grasshoppers up the side of them. That's a report. But Caleb and Joshua said we can take it. We are able to do it. Why are they able to do it? God had promised them to do it. I like that courage. Ten of them. Now the church came, and it's come now to a place to where we've come down to the Luther age, the Methodist age, and the Pentecostal age, and on down to a place, and now some of the full gospel people turned firmly against divine healing, believed that it wasn't even in the atonement, but it's got to a place, friends, where you it's getting horrible out here. Old time religion, they say it's something that's passed long ago. Can't have it. It's too much. We're living in a modern day. We've got to get modern ideas. We got to have shuffleboards in the church, ping pong games, and everything to hold our young people. Brother and sister, if it ever gets to a time that I have to have a card party in the church to hold an audience, I'll quit preaching the gospel because it's lost its power. I'll tell you, brother, what we need today is the old-fashioned, simple gospel, Holy Ghost power. Preach in simplicity. Man, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw a man unto me. Amen. Yes, sir. We, they, they say, oh, we can't go back and do those things. As the apostles did, we're living in the last days when God has promised he'd pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Hallelujah. Amen. We are here at the end of the road. Thank God for some Caleb's and Joshua that's ready to go over. Hallelujah. Go over and bring back the evidence. Hallelujah. It's a great land. Bring him back two bunches of grapes and they walk it like this to try to pack it. What a ground. What a place. Thank God for people who's crossed over out of that old formal shackle down ungodly church boss back condition. Hallelujah. Got to a place where they stepped over and came to land and eat a lot of good grapes that he makes his slobber in a pulpit. Hallelujah. So that good old fashioned drunk on the wine like Peter drank on the day of Pentecost when the power of God took over the church. Hallelujah. Hey. Hey. Barney, uh, we can do it. The Lord said, do you mean to tell me we can get the Holy Ghost like they did a long time ago? Yes, sir. Now, how do you know? I said, I got it. Hallelujah. That's how I know it. We had a beautiful type last night. When the children of Israel crossed the land, crossed over into the, the pilgrimage, which was a perfect type of our pilgrimage. We come up out of Canaan. I pulled my stake tents and left. Have you? Leaving the old garlics and hash pots down there and stink of the world. Pulled up tent, left, crossed over Jordan. Hallelujah. The Red Sea of the blood of Jesus Christ drowned in every old cigarette, tobacco, nice and filled of the world. Was drowned like them taskmasters back there and left pouring in the sea. Hallelujah. No wonder we shout and dance. Look what Moses done. Raised his hand and sang in the spirit. And Miriam got a tambourine to get a dance and jump up and down. And praise God. And the daughters of Israel followed her, dancing and praising God and shouting. Hallelujah. They crossed over. All the old taskmasters is back dead there in the city. Looked back and said, boy, you'll never bother me no more. <laughs> oh, my. Burnt the bridges all over. Ready to go now. Journey on. Now they say, can we take it? Sure, we can take it. Why, God said so. And remember, they were, God promised to supply their needs. We had it last night. How are they going to supply it? I don't know. Well, maybe they'll send over some dough somewhere. From a, there ain't nothing left in Egypt. Where's the dough going to come from? Oh, my. It ain't my business. Someone said to me one time, said, do you believe about that Elijah, that bird story up there? And I said, Sure. Said, so you mean to tell me you believe that preacher sat down by the brook cedars up there and crows fed him? I said, sure. How do you know they fed him? I said, the Bible said so. Right. So I want to ask you 
said some preacher, said, why in the world do you think those crows got them sandwiches? I said, I don't know. They brought them. Elijah eat them. <laughs> no, I know. He said, I believe you all get excited. I said, no. I can't tell you where it comes from, but it comes from somewhere. God brings it. We eat it. Hallelujah. And it brings joy. How it happens, I don't know. God just sends it. I grab it. <laughs> I got a handful just a few minutes ago and swallowed it. Still tickle me as it goes down. Good. Hey. Don't get excited. I'm not crazy. I've been called that, but I'm not. If I am, just let me alone. I'm happy. All right. Yes, sir. I feel pretty religious right now. Sure do. All right. Look at him. Here they are. How are we going to do it? Now, God rained manna down out of the heaven and fed them, didn't he? He sure did. And they picked it up. We went through it. Now, that was a perfect type of our feeding today. That manna never ceased. It fell every night. Every night, all the time they were in their journey out of Egypt into the Promised Land. And the Holy Ghost fell as soon as the disciples left Egypt. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came from heaven, same place the manna come from, like a rushing mighty wind, Filled all the house where they were setting, clove and tongue, set up on them like fire. They went out of there screaming and acting like drunk man, dancing, staggering, screaming, slobbering, and everything else. Like, you ever see an old drunk coming home? Boy, he's taking both sides of the street. And oh, stranger, nothing bother him. And there's no condemnation to them that's in Christ Jesus. That walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8 1. Here they come. Coming along. Now, staggered under the impact of the Holy Spirit, which was God's manna come down from heaven, and it fell from that day down to this day. Amen. Every, you know what, the omer was kept full. That every priest entering in could eat a mouthful of the original manna. How long was this manna last? Reviewing what it was last night in the lesson, Peter said, repent every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises to you, to your children, to them that fall off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. The Holy Ghost is just the same Holy Ghost tonight as it was back there at the beginning. Amen. Can we take it? Yes, sir. The church comes to Kadesh. What you going to do? Here we are and say, now every individual, you're each one of Kadesh, we come there. They say, now, if I, if I go up there and get some of the holy roll of religion they talk about, my mammy will turn me out of the home. There they are, Kadesh. Can you do it? Yes, God promised it to you. I come not to bring peace, but a sober. I come to separate father, mother, husband, wife, sister, brother, and everything, and he that won't forsake his own and follow me is not worthy to be called mine. Amen. And he that puts his hand to the plow and even turns to look back is not worthy. That's right. Brother, I tell you, it means a whole lot more run up and shake the hands of the preacher and a few drops of water sprinkled on you. Amen. That's right. Brother, it owns a whole lot more walking up to the altar and taking communion and walking back and sit down in your seat. It means a selling out, dying out, brother, and getting an old-fashioned backwood sky blue sin killing religion that don't wash you white, but don't white wash you, but washes you white. Yeah. Hallelujah. Cleans you up, burns you out, scours you out, sterilizes you, and makes you a new person. Amen. 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 That's old sass for ass time, brother. But I'll tell you, stick to your ribs, get some of it. Amen. That's right. It'll hold you to the trials. Amen. I feel like shouting for there. That's pretty big. For yes, sir. Now think of it, brother, it's secured. God said so. Can we take it? Sure we can take it. In the last days I'll pour out my spirit and I'll show signs and wonders. Hallelujah. He said he would do it. God promised it. We're at Kadesh. Let's go get it. Somebody's been over and brought back some grapes. I know the land's good. <laughs> That's right. Let's go over and get some of them. That's right. The church began to murmur and squirm and everything. God would have sent the church out years ago if they'd just to listen to him. 
But they started to arguing and fussing and murmuring around. The Methodists had an old-fashioned revival back in the days of Spurgeon. They would begin to receive gifts and so forth. And the church got right in there and began to tear that thing up. And the church has been wandering in the wilderness ever since. Amen. Wandering around. It broke up into Nazarene, Pilgrim, Holiness, and this, that, and this, and that, and that, and the other, and everything else. So now it's like a big bunch of I don't know why. Amen. It's true. They organized great schools and thought they'd teach the theology of some places. I said last night, it puts them in mind of Undertaker's morgue. Go around there, so cold, you go in the spiritual phenomena, the monitor says 100 below zero. Somebody, one time not long ago, a little old woman come in from the country. She walked in, she had her little long dress on it all up around her neck up here. She walked in, and her, her son take her down to church. She's ashamed of her. She walked up to the door, she said, Good morning, Elder. <laughs> walked in like that, and her husband, or her brother, her son said, Oh, mother, mother, you be still. He didn't go to some big aristocrat church, you know. She said, well, glory to God, amen, how's it going? She didn't know no difference. Let me tell you, brother, her name might not have been in who's who, as a lot of them got to say that 400 perfect, but her name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'd rather have mine there than all the who's who. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That tells who's who. Amen. The name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. She walked in, sat down like that. The preacher began to say, um, now the Lord Jesus Christ came to the earth to save the sinner. She said, Amen, glory to God. That's right, brother. And everybody, and everybody squeaked their neck around like a gander somewhere, looking around, wondering why. And so he said, <clears throat> he's reading his notes, you know. So he's kind of got mixed up in it. He said, <clears throat> excuse me. said, and uh, as I was saying, the Lord Jesus Christ came to the earth. She said, glory to God. That's right, brother. Hallelujah. So the usher walked back and picked her on her shoulder and said, Mrs., you'll have to keep still or we'll have to put you out. <laughs> oh, my. Hallelujah. That's what we got into. That's right. Schools of the prophets. We raise up the teachers. We inject old in, in bombing and fluid into them to keep them. They're dead anyhow. And then put embalming fluid in, keep it dead. Or some of this old theology that they teach the days of miracles is past. There's no such thing as heartfelt religion. Puts me in mind of a colored man down in the south. The old fella packed his Bible all around. I said, Why carry that Bible for a boy? He said, I believe it. He said, You can't read a word in it. I said, I believe it anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> said, I believe it from kibber to kibber, be the kibber also. Ah, <laughs> you know, it's got a holy Bible wrote on it. <laughs> yes, sir, he believed it anyhow. <laughs> Didn't make any difference. said, What would you do? He said, You'd do anything in that Bible? He said, The Lord told me to do anything, I'd do it. He said, well, I can tell you to jump through that wall. He said, I jumped. He said, you think you can walk through that wall without a hole in it? He said, the Lord told me to jump and make a hole in it for me. That's right, too, brother. Hallelujah. That's the truth. God tells you to jump. He'll have a hole there when you get there. Don't you worry about it. School, theology. Oh, my. You know what they've done? In the space of the upper room, they substituted a supper room. Boil up some old rooster and set up for 50 cents a plate to try to pay the preacher. Brother, if you paid your tithes and done what God said for you to do, you wouldn't have these old shoes and things like that. Amen! Even the only all jumped off on that. Let me tell you something, brother. God wants a church that moves the word of the will of God based upon thus saith the Lord. Yes, sir. They've taken all the tearing in the upper room out like that. What they've done for the Holy Ghost, they've substituted theology for it. Somebody go out and say, well, we believe this and we believe that. Why do you believe it? That in the Bible? Nothing about it. Somebody said, why do you think that priest down here today run away with that woman and married her? I said he had a right to. Amen. God must try to get married as I ever anybody else. Amen. Can't find that in the Bible. Some Catholic boy said, is that right, Billy? I said, it's the truth. He said, show it to me. And I said, well, I'll show it to you in the Bible that marriage is honorable among all. Amen. Hallelujah. Paul said every man has his own wife. That's exactly right. I said, that's a, a Roman hookup, and there's no more truth to it than there is to uh, the bottomless pits of hell. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe God's Word. I got to believe something. This is done to the Lord. Amen. One time they had a bunch of them preachers out like that back in the Old Testament. Teach them a whole lot of things. I'm not sure what, what kind of an education they had. Let's teach them all about the theology of that day. The school of prophets. They come over to see a real prophet one day. The prophet said to one of them, Go out and pick your lap full of, 
uh, some pottage now. We put on the big kettle. We're going to have a, a great big cooked up pot of uh, peas out here. And you know what that preacher done? He went out and picked a lap full of gourds, uh, green gourds, <laughs> off of a wild vine. Boy, a guy that didn't know the difference between peas and a wild gourd is some preacher. I tell you, he threw them into the pot and began to cook it. First thing you know, everybody got a big dish full of it like that. He said, there's death in the pot. That's what's the matter today. There's death in the pot. Some of these old cold seminary farmer ungodly places going on trying to teach some theology. They're killing the people, taking them away from Christ. We need a baptism of the Holy Ghost to give life. Hallelujah. I feel about twice my size now. Look, that's the truth, brother. Uh, Bill, you're cooking something. That's right. You're cooking up something. What you cooking? <laughs> that's the next thing. A guy that didn't know the difference between green gourds and peas. <laughs> that's about like some of them. <laughs> that's the truth. Yes, sir. Said he's death in the pot. Old Elijah was a real prophet. He said, oh, don't worry about it. Don't get all stirred. <laughs> hey, man, we got a guy who's got a double potion. Yeah. Hey. Hallelujah. He had been over across the Canaan's land and been back. Got a double potion. Said, bring know what to do when trouble come up. Said, go get me a handful of meal. <laughs> he took the meal and threw it in the pots and I eat all you want to. It's all right now. Why the meal? The meal was there for the, wave, for the meal offering, the wave offering before the Lord. And that meal had to be ground with a burr that ground every grain the same. That meal offering was Christ. Amen. But Christ is every burr ground the same. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. When there's death in the pot, put Christ in there. Hallelujah. I first seen somebody with the Holy Ghost was an old colored man, a big long overcoat on. They had to help him out. He was so old like this. He got up there and began to preach. A lot of them preachers began to preach about all oh, what will take place here on earth. He took his text back in Job. Where was you when I laid the foundation of the world? When the morning stars sang together, the sons of God shouted for joy. He said, you think we got some kind of new kind of religion? He said, brother, I just got an old time case or a brand new case of old time religion. That's why the Holy Ghost got a hold of him. Poor old fellow, so stiff, he's standing there. He straightened himself up, kicked his heels together, and said, Glory! Hallelujah! Said, Jay, got enough room up here for me to preach. Walked all over the platform. I said, Brother, if you'll do that for a man 80 years old, what would it do for me? I own it! Hallelujah! Right! Yes, sir, I was having a big time. Went right out of the cornfield on my old rusty knees. I went and was praying for it. That's right. Like old buddy Robinson. Kept the long, long one, the Holy Ghost. That door that down on the Holy Ghost so bad, I didn't know what to do. He said, I'd try and corner one morning, old Eric, he's new. Said, Eric kept stepping on the corner. I got mad at him over that, bit him on the ears as hard as I could. Eric kicked at me, said, I went over, sat down, and I looked at him. He sat there and said, I bit the old Eric as hard as I could. Said, I looked over at him, said, Eric. So he said, Eric, I'm sorry, I won't do that anymore. Said, Eric, looked around, said, you go get more religion. What you got now? You keep treating me that way again. <laughs> my, my. Right. He said, I got out of the corner and said, Good Lord, give me lots of knowledge in the Gabriel into my soul. Help me fight the devil as long as I got a tooth in my mouth and gummy until I die. <laughs> he said, Lord, if you don't give me the Holy Ghost when you come back to earth, you're going to find a pile of bones laying right here. He got it. <laughs> Amen. That's right. You really get out and meet it before God. God will take you over across there. No matter what the seminary preachers say, we can have the Holy Ghost cause God promised it to us. Amen. That's where Caleb based his faith. That's where Joshua based it. Because God said it's yours. Amen. I've already given it to you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hey, I like that. Thanks. Not all will I have. Hey. Those who he called, he justified. Is that right? Yes. And those who he justified, he glorified. Is that right? Yes. Then, brother, in heaven we're already glorified together with Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's right. Just let the devil squall and scream. Have all his tantrums he wants to. Thus saith the Lord. Amen. That's right. Oh, my. Let's get over here somewhere. You go preaching somewhere else where you get off of that a little bit. Oh, how marvelous. 
They got to murmuring after that, fussing. Let's go over about 21st chapter and begin about the 5th verse. They got to murmuring there, fussing, carrying on, cut the water supply off. Maybe that's what's the matter with the church tonight. Doing too much fussing and grumbling around the water supplies cut off. You know, I, I travel around over the world a lot, and one of the most stickeriest, nastiest places try to lay down is in the desert. Everything there's got a sticker on it. You know why? Every time a little old weed's a cactus, you can't lay down no where it's sticking you. The reason of it is they ain't got no water. Water makes it soft. Where there's lots of water, you don't have any thorns and thistles. Where there's lots of water. Now I tell you, brother, you take an old church that's dry and it's bone and no Holy Ghost in it, and no salvation, no divine healing, no power of God, no shouting, no joy. And it's always this old, she done this and he done this and he done that sticker, sticker, sticker. Watch your knees a good old fashioned outpouring gusher of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah! Soften up a little bit. Hey. Amen! That means so be it. <laughs> Bram Tabernacle needs a good dose of that too. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Well, is that right? <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm having a good time up here. My clothes fit me just exactly right, Brother Higginbottom. <laughs> yes, sir. My collar's not too big. My shirt fits just feels good. Even my wife's not here. <laughs> so I, I just have a glorious time. Oh, don't you tell her. <laughs> All right. But I'm having a good time. You say you're happy? Sure I'm happy. How can I keep from being happy and know what I know? Amen. Christ save me. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. Give me a ticket to heaven. I'm just having a big time going on and say, Come on, all of you. Amen. Yes, sir. Reminds me of a guy one time that once set a hen. No hen had he had enough eggs to set all but one. And he didn't have he thought, What am I going to do for that one egg? So he goes out and he finds a duck egg and he puts it under the old hen. And the old hen hatched out all of her chickens and a duck too. And they're walking along in the barnyards, you know. And if that little old duck didn't look out of his place, about like one of you holy rollers, you know. Walking on quack, 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 like that. And the old they'd get out behind the barn, you know, and the old hen would catch a grasshopper, and quack, 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 quack. Here she goes, tuck, 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 and here come the little chickens running to her like that, everyone. But the little old duck didn't know what the call was. Quack, quack. He didn't know what all that dust meant. It got his nostrils and everything. He's a funny-looking little fella. Out of this place, like a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost member in an old, cold, formal church. <laughs> Just out of place. Talk about all this, that, and the other, and who's president. They won't know who God. They won't know about God. Amen. But she old oh, hen made a mistake one day, just like what the old church did. That's right. She got out one day way up in the barnyard, like that man, going, and after a while, the little old duck stuck his head up, and he smelt water. <laughs> it was his nature, you know. <laughs> Amen. He smelt water. He said, honk, honk. Honk, honk. Oh, my. He wasn't chicken nature anyhow. He was a duck nature. <laughs> so he smelt the water. as a creek run down there. The old hen hollered, cluck, 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 cluck. He hollered, honk, 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 honk. Go and rush straight to the water as hard as he could. That's the way it is, man. When a man's born to the kingdom of God, the old church can say, you can't play my holy roars. It's nonsense. It's this day out there. Honk, honk, honk. He's got to get to the water. Hallelujah. It was his nature. He couldn't help it. There was something in him calling to the water. And when God's in a heart, he'll call you to an old-fashioned Holy Ghost meeting. Glory to God. Glory. That's right, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Unless your nature's been changed, you'll still listen to the cluck of the old hen. But when you smell water, if you're a duck, you're a gong gong when cause you're headed for the water. Hallelujah! <laughs> Joshua said, I, we can make it. Amen. Joshua said, we can do it. Caleb said, we can do it. Why do you know we can do it? He said, because God has said so. And we're going over. We're going to make it. And we're going to do it in the way they went. They took off to the land. 
And they got the evidence of the Holy Spirit, and they come back to prove it. The land was good. It was bearing good grapes. I'm glad of it, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, my, just eat them and slobber like a horse eating clover. <laughs> That's right. Yes, yeah, sir, just have a big time with y'all. Well, I don't care what the world says. Nothing to me. The very God that raised me up and saved my soul and sent me out around here praying for kings and everything else across the country. It was this good old-fashioned Holy Ghost that did it. I've Amen. never been ashamed of it. I said in kings' palaces, I have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's right. They're hungry, too. Amen. They're hungry and thirsty. Lord. Look here. They got to murmur and got to complaining. The water supply was cut off. Now, hurry. What time we got? Say, I'm sorry. I'm late. Excuse me for teaching too long. Uh, I haven't taught yet, have I? But just a minute. I'll get to my lesson after a while. No, I was just kidding you. Sit still. Let's get just a few words here. I got something I want to say. The fifth verse of the 21st chapter. Now, listen real close. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Where have you brought us out into the, from Egypt into this wilderness where there's no water and, and our souls loweth this light bread? After being filled with the good angels' food and everything, he said, oh, we're tired of it. We'd like to have some garlic and some barmanical. They want us the old flesh pots of Egypt. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and bit the people, and much people died. Therefore came to Moses, and he said, We have sinned, and we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the fiery serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make a fiery serpent, and set it on a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent out of brass, and he put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if, any, if a serpent had bitten a man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Oh, let me get that, that little thing there before we get into the morning night service. The brass serpent, as the smitten rock last night, as we ended up on the smitten rock, the brass serpent was Jesus Christ. You say a serpent? Yes. The serpent represented Sin already judged. God judged the serpent in the Garden of Eden and the third chapter of Genesis and the 14th verse. God already passed judgment upon the serpent. Oh, he was beautiful and walked upright. He was the most subtle of all the beasts of the field. But God judged him and put him down on his belly for the rest of his days. On his belly. Judge and Christ was our sins judged. Amen. Amen. You see it? Beautiful. My sins, your sins, justly should go to hell and be punished for our sins, but Christ took our place. Amen. The serpent. Amen. That's why it represented Christ. Brass. The serpent being made out of brass meant divine judgment. Now, the serpent was sin already judged. And the brass meant divine judgment, like the brazen altar. The altar was made out of brass that burnt the bodies of the sacrifice. Exodus 17, chapter, you'll find it. Then, you're putting on your scriptures. Now, uh, they've taken the beast, they washed it. Perfect type, baptism, brought it in, put their hands on it, confessed their sins, cut the throat. The blood was poured in a... Meat burnt at the blood on the sacrifice block on the altar, brazen altar, where the sins were repudiated, where the, where the just God required entire separation. And the divine judgment of God with the fire burnt up the sin sacrifice. Hallelujah. God's divine judgment was up on Jesus Christ. Look, divine judgment again. In the days of Elijah. Sure, that's divine judgment. Elijah come a time where there was nothing. The people had got away from God. And Elijah went up on the mountain and he prayed. He come before the king and said, Not even do will fall from heaven till I call for him. And for three years and six months, dew didn't even come on the earth. 
And when he comes to the place, Elijah said, let us prove who is God, the fiery God. Our God is a consuming fire. Let the God that answers by fire. That's what I say tonight. Let the God that answers by fire. Amen. The Holy Ghost and fire. Amen. Let him be God. Amen. Now, they put the watch. He went up after they brought the fire out of heaven and so forth and uh, consumed the sacrifice. They looked up to the skies and it looked like brass. What was it? Divine judgment over all the nation. And brother, sister, if you look around today, you'll see the color of brass again. Divine judgment coming up on the nation. Judgment. The fiery serpent. Fiery serpent's divine judgment in there. Now what? He lifted up this pole that had the, the serpent on it made out of brass. And whosoever looked up on that serpent got healed of their diseases. What a beautiful picture tonight of Jesus Christ. He said, as Moses, just as Moses lifted up the bright serpent in the wilderness, here it is, I get it. If you're sick, you'll find out what will heal you. As Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the bright serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The same reason. And a compound reason. He was wounded for our transgressions with his stripes we were healed. They were murmuring against God and against Moses and were bitten by serpents. The serpent taken care of a twofold uh, app application. The first was to forgive their sins and to heal their sickness. And Jesus was lifted up that he might forgive our sins and heal our sickness. Amen. Next in the road, after that come Balaam, the hireling prophet. Come down to stop Israel. Oh my, we'll get into that tomorrow night. How that that fella in a dumb mule had to speak and rebuke him. A preacher out of the will of God with his mind on money. Amen. Go down there and a mule had to rebuke him. Down there a dumb mule. If God can speak to a dumb mule, surely he could do a man. Yes, yes sir. Notice that poor old Moses. After all that time, I'll show you what a man is before God. How poor and all of those. Notice, when God told Moses, step out of the way, Moses. I'm going to destroy the whole bunch of them, and they got a new a mighty nation. And Moses threw himself in the front of God, bridged his way, and said, God, take me. And God could not cross that man. The power of a saint before God. Look at there. Look at old Eli Isaiah goes up and tells the prophet Hezekiah, set your house in order, you're going to die. Thus saith the Lord. What an embarrassment it was. In a couple hours to turn back again, the Holy Spirit met him, called Hezekiah, turned his face to the wall and wept bitterly and said, Lord, I beseech you to consider me. I've walked before you with a perfect heart. And tears run down his cheek, and God had already sealed his doom. But prayer changed things. Yeah. He said to the prophet, go back and tell him, look, what a warrior Moses was. In his last hours, he got down there with that horrible temper and finally glorified himself in the stead of God. And God would not permit him. Of course, it's all pre picture. Just like the organizations today, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecost, all the rest of them, they're glorifying themselves. A few days ago, one of the biggest churches, just because they couldn't be the only duck in the puddle, they thumbs down on a meeting like that. I said, I don't have to have your cooperation. Where the eagles are, the car where the carcasses, the eagles will gather. And that was right. Amen. Yes, sir. You just tell the truth. God will take care of the rest of it. Amen. And there they was. Oh, we are the predominating. I said, I don't care what you are. God is the predominating one in our lives. Amen. That's right. It takes Amen. God. Not what the church says. And the church, every one of them, any historian here is willing to look this up, there never was a church that ever fell, that ever rose again. God lays them on the shelf. They never. The Lutheran fell, the Methodist fell, the Presbyterian, Baptist, all down through, and the Pentecostal too. 
God just throws it back on the shelf. And uh, if you believe me to be God's prophet, you listen to this, and I say it with inspiration, not exactly now, but what has come before this, that there will not be one organization represented, of uh, what I mean, the whole organization, into the kingdom of God, but God will pull out of every one of them the cream of the crop and fill it with the Spirit and take it up into glory. Right. The Bible predicts that the last church age is the Lady of Sin church age, which is a lukewarm. And that's just as far as the church has got today. That's right. They got down to where maybe they could clap their hands a little bit and make a little noise and jump up and kick the branch for a while. But when it comes to really living a pure, holy, unadulterated, sanctified life, they're as far away as the night is from the day. That's right. What we need today is an old-fashioned dying out, brother, where it ain't go back to the altar and get over and go back to the altar again, go back to the altar, go over there and stay till you're dead, and then a dead man knows nothing about the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't want to get started on that again. Look. Brother, let me tell you, God, after having his poor old servant Moses, someone said to me one time, said, I tell you, that shows God, if you call him God. Said he let his servant down. After Moses' life running a cycle of 40, he was called at 40, refused by his brethren, went out on the desert and herded sheep for 40 years. When he was 80, he sent him down to deliver Israel out of Egypt, and when he got close to the promised land, he was 120 years old. He had the stride of a young man, and his sight never failed him. <laughs> That's right, at 120. But when he glorified himself down there instead of God before that rock, when God told him, said, go speak to the rock, don't smite it, speak to it. The rock was only smitten once. And Moses got his temper all up and run down there, smote the rock, he didn't bring water, smote it again. He brought water and said, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Like that, and brought forth the waters because God had to listen to that prophet because it endued him with that power, and that broke the whole program of God's Bible. Christ was smitten once. We speak to the rock now, and it brings forth its water. See, it's already been smitten. Just speak to it, and it brings forth its water. Then I seen that morning, oh, when I think of this picture, my heart almost failed me. I see Moses. He knows God said, Moses, tell them all so long, your congregation. I'm going to call you up a little higher now today. I see old Moses stand there, that long white beard, his hair trickling down around his face, his old eyes dimming with tears as he looked over his audience, how he fell in the how they murmured and how he stood for him. He looked him all over. He started walking up the mountain. He got up the mountain. He turned back around. He began to wave goodbye at him. He climbed up, come up to the top of the mountain. It was in the month of April. He stood and looked over into the promised land. Oh, how he wanted to go over. My his poor old heart was breaking. He wanted to go over into the promised land of that bunch of Jews. And he had led and stood in the way. And there he was. He looked over there and the tears running down his cheeks. He turned around and waved to the people again goodbye, their old pastor. He was going away. He waved at him like that. He looked back over and on oh, no, if I could stand where Moses stood and view the landscape over. God willing, in the next few months, I want to stand on the mountain there and look over where they crossed. I seen a movie the other day where some of the brethren, about 40 of my brethren out of the campaigns and there, went over there and they took a movie reel of it. And when they crossed there, them fellows screamed and shouted and like, tore down all the bushes on the bank where the children of Israel went up there where Jesus was baptized. And every one of them preachers jumped in the water with clothes on their own and baptized one another over again. Every one of them. Oh, man! There's something in there moving and stirring we're living. They get in a car, they ride up pieces, they come over that journey there where the children of Israel is. Like old buddy Robbins, they stop this thing, right tweaking, they got out and run around, 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 shouting around the place, and hollering, glory to God, hallelujah. Jump back in the driver on. <laughs> That's right. He's just having such a time. Sure. If I could stand where Moses stood on that rock, looking over into the promised land, he wanted to go and he looked back to his congregation, waved goodbye at him again. A tear dropping off his long beard. His hours are coming. His sleeves round over his sleeves here. The pulse begin to come up his sleeves. An old veteran. I can tell you right now, brother, don't think I'm going to bad this this for a little bit. But, brother, he wasn't lost. <laughs> no, he wasn't. God won't let his servant down. There are the sleeves coming up like this. And the first thing you know is caught. Paul, pulse cooling off. His eyes begin to get dim as he looked over there. <laughs> Over in that land, how he wanted to go over it. Oh, my, his heart was breaking. Just as he got ready to move out of this life, he had to look standing by his side. There stood the rock. Just so he's there. 
That's all. He stepped over on the rock. The angels come packed him away. Eight hundred years from there, there he was standing over in the promised land by the side of Elijah talking to Jesus. He don't let you down. Some of these days, I've got to come to the end of the road. I'm 43 years old now, getting pretty well broke up. I've preached 20 years. I've waded through waters and broke ice and stood and baptized so I'd freeze and everything. I've done without, went without, into the jungles and everything else and diseases and everything lurking. I don't know how long I'll stay. But if I shall live to see longer than this, maybe when I get to be an old man of Jesus tarries, I'll probably stand with what hair I got hanging down low. All my people take the palsy when they get old. They shake. When I fought my way through every battle, all my buddies and things are gone on. I stand there to hear the dashing of the water coming across there. I'm shaking on my stick like this. I want to take the old sword here, stick her back in the sheep of eternity, pull off my helmet and lay it down, raise up my hand, hallelujah, and say, Lord, push out the lifeboat. I'm coming across this morning. I'm coming across the river. He won't let me down, man. And while I'm here, while it's right, I'll preach and pray and beg and sing and do everything I can for the kingdom of God. When my soul begins to lift from this body and I look back down to see my footprints, I want them in the right kind of a place where parties leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Shall we bow our heads? Teddy, go to the piano a moment. Our Heavenly Father, oh, for these great rejoicing times, how happy I guess I get a little bit beside myself, Lord. Just the Holy Spirit just baptizing my soul. I just can't help it. Something just gets a hold of me. I'm so thankful, Lord, to have all the dishpans and gutters cleaned out so the Holy Spirit can come. Keep the kink out of the hose so the waters of salvation can pour down in any time God wants it to. Pray it out. As Elijah told Jehoshaphat, he said, dig ditches. Get all the rocks out, all the sticks and stumps. There's going to be some water coming. Thank you, Lord. Thou hast been here tonight. Now think of old prophet Moses. God bless his gallant soul. As you stood there on the mount looking over in the promised land. We stand tonight looking that way, Lord. The only thing I ask you for myself is let that rock be there when I'm going. God, that'll be all right with me. And all that I've ever done in life, Lord, if I can just crawl up and touch your sacred feet once, pat them with my unworthy hand, that'll repay me a million times. We all know we got to go that road. Some of us may in a few hours. I don't know. Thou knowest. While we're here tonight, Father, and the Holy Spirit is still present, been down blessing your people. Father, I ask you something. Is there uh, someone here that's unsaved, Lord, that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, doesn't know how they stand before you. I'm going to ask you, Lord, if you will just, not that these people hear me now, but I'm going to ask you if you'll just speak to that heart and give them courage tonight. It might be the final call. How do we know? Why take a chance when all eternity rests upon this? If there be, Lord, or one wayward one out of the way, maybe climbing the hill to look over into the land, and then be rejected. God, may the rock be with them, I pray. Help us now and bless this audience while we wait. Now, if there's a man or a woman in here, boy or girl, with your head bound, you don't know one, look up, please. People are very timid sometimes, touchy along these matters, but gentlemen and women, I've had a lot of a lot of ground behind me in these 43 years. 
just a few days ago, I was a little old boy running around here playing marbles with you. Well, I'm failing. I can feel it. I, I tried for 20 years to try to introduce to you something. Jeffersonville, why do you reject it? When God's vindicated, sent his angel, took the picture of it. It's known around the world. Why would you think it was some kind of a, a make-believe something? Are you without God tonight? You'd love to know him, really. You know you want that kind of a salvation before you die. Here some time ago in this very city, this young girl belonged to a certain church here in the city. She thought she was all right. Her pastor told her she was all right. She made fun of a little girl come to church because she wouldn't go to the show. She said, your pastor is narrow-minded. The little girl said, that's all right. After a while, she got out with some rough company and she caught a disease to let it run too far. The doctor, a certain doctor of this city, went to examine her, come to find out she was eat up with venereal disease. She died right after that. They, she was a Sunday school teacher in this big church. They were all out there and to see her go to heaven. And just about time they, her Sunday school class then, her pastor walking out in the hall smoking a cigarette. And when about time for her to take her flight, the angels to come get her, she raised up. She said, where's the pastor? They went and got him. He said, you deceiver of man? So why'd you let me get in this shape? I'm lost. Don't worry. Adam knew he had fig leaves on when he come before God. It was all right when God wasn't there. So why'd you let me go like this? So where's that little old girl up at that tabernacle? Oh, she, he said, yeah, you are, you're hysterical. We're going to call a doctor and give you a hypo. She said, you deceiver of man. I'm lost in my soul. I'm going to hell on account of you. She bowed her head. And a good friend of mine works in the garage right now was working for an undertaker. They went out to pump the bot fluid in her body. And it kept pumping. They kept smelling the fluid and couldn't get her veins filled and come to pull her clothes down and look. There's a hole eating her body there big as your fist nearly. The neural disease needed out. Oh, yeah, she's going to have a big time. This little old girl was a holy roller. Don't underestimate anything, friend. Do you know him tonight? Are you really saved? I'm asking you in Jesus' name. If there's a man or a woman, boy or girl in here tonight that's not saved, born again, would you raise your hand? Say, pray for me, Brother Bram. I ever head bowed. Yes, God bless you, young lady. God bless you, 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 you. God bless you, God bless you, you, you. Back in the back, that's, God bless you. God bless your sincerity, young man. I see you. Wonderful. 20 or 30 hands in this little building. Unregenerated. The Holy Spirit's been here tonight talking to you. He's here now. You need him. Why don't you come? Won't you come up to the altar and kneel down and say, Lord God, I'm going to receive you as my personal Savior tonight. I'm going to accept you now, and I'm going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I want it. I don't care what the world's got to say. I'm going to receive now. You promised me. And listen, every one of you that held your hand, you've been listening to these, media, these meetings. No one in here could come to Jesus except God draws him. What's doing that? What's making that desire? God is here. God is here. Listen, friend, if God will hear my prayer as a man, if you believe me to be his prophet, and you've read the newspapers and the magazines and books and authorities and look back there at them pictures that they're selling at the back of the door at night of that angel of God flaming with fire, the same one I'm reading about here in the burning bush, and you believe me to be God's servant, and you believe that he'd hear my prayer, and I'll hear your prayer. If you'll pray, would you like to rise up out of your seat? Have you got that much real conviction? Come here, stand at this altar and say, Brother Branham, if he'll open the eyes of the blind, he'll forgive my sins and my... God bless you, young man, to make yourself the first one to move. Who will follow this young man to this altar? I want the ministers of this building to come in the building, come here to the altar just a minute. Every preacher. Come, young lady. God bless you. Somebody else now. I want the ministers to come up here at the top of the platform, if you will. Sinner friend, 
Come right up, young man. God bless you. Come right up and kneel down right there. God bless you, sir. You come. God bless you, lady. God bless you. Someone else. Make your way up here at the altar. Kneel down. Are you without God, without Christ tonight? In a world alienated away? Or you say it's getting a little late in my people's way. A little crippled girl's making her way. Shame on you healthy people. Are you an alien from God tonight? Without God, without Christ. Dying in sin and shame. Won't you come? Will you be man or woman enough with common decency enough to rise up and say, Brother Branham, I'm coming up here. I want to shake your hand and kneel down here at the altar. And I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior right now. Will you come? All those hands up. And you need to tell me to know that you're standing here in the presence of God. To know that you're in this condition and still refuse to come to an altar. What if your heart stops tonight when you go home? What if you have an accident and you're in a hospital an hour from now, the blood going from your body and you're screaming, but nobody to pray. God said, if you neglect me now, I'll laugh in your calamity. Won't you come? Really? You mean that you are convinced enough that the Holy Spirit here, that you'll raise your hand and won't come to the altar? What in the world will hold you? God bless you, sir. I perceive that you're a sick man, too, that you're coming, aren't you? You suffer with TB, don't you? He's going to heal you here at the altar tonight. You're a stranger to me, but I know what you are and who you are. Holy Spirit drops right in the meeting, and that angel of God is standing at the platform. You've been in the meetings, you know what this means, don't you? The man's going to be healed tonight. God spoke this as you raised him there. God bless you, son. Come right on. Come weeping, your eyes full of tears. God bless you, sister. Come right on. God bless you. Come kneel right around the altar. Won't you come? people in there. Be honest with God, won't you? What you going to lose to walk up here at the altar and pray a little? You're going to pray somewhere. If you don't pray here, you're going to pray in hell. The rich man lifted up his eyes. Now, if you believe, if you believe God's word and believe that I tell the truth, if God's vindicated the truth, there's men and women in here ought to be at this altar right now. The Holy Spirit speaking, saying so. 
God bless you, sister. You're just one of them. Come on, God bless you. Come now, wherever you are, young or old, come. Let's stand, all you people in your seats. Stand while we sing one verse of this now. Come on now, reach around. Let's make our way to the altar. You belong to church, you say, that ain't enough. Except the man be born again, he'll know why he's in the kingdom. Come on now. Just that. Everyone, uh, won't you come out? Won't you come down the aisle here now? Come here and meet me at the altar.